Hi, I'm Meredith Bell, President and Co-Founder of Performance Support Systems, and I'm very excited to have with me today Dr. John Reed. John, welcome. Thank you, Meredith. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm very excited to have you. And before we get started, I want to tell people just a little bit about you. John is the Managing Director at a consulting and coaching firm called Quinn Reed Associates. And today I'm going to be talking to him about his wonderful book called Pinpointing Excellence, The Key to Finding a Quality Executive Coach. I love that title, John. John is highly qualified to write about this topic because he has been certified and is as an executive coach at many high level executive certification programs. He's also been an executive coach globally for what, more than 20 years, right, John? And he also has an MBA from Dartmouth, um, multiple master level executive coaching certifications, as I mentioned, and he also has a PhD and licensure in business psychology. So he's got quite a, a wealth of experience and knowledge in this whole field of executive coaching. And he has also worked with hundreds of executives globally from Fortune uh, 50 companies, I believe it is, John, right? Um, to startup, so a wide range of coaches. And because of this, I've got lots of questions. So John, are you ready to get started? I'm ready. I'll, I'll do my best, Mary. Oh, <laughs> well, the first one, a question I have for you is, is pretty easy. I think it's, I'd really like for you to tell people, what is it about your experiences that gave you the material, basically, to create this book? Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll try and I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of this, Meredith. Uh, so I, uh, I went to college and business school. And then, like most people in my era who came out of a good business school, I was trying to decide between investment banking or management consulting as a career path. And I picked consulting. And I worked for, I think, 11 years in that field and had some pretty good luck. And it, it was great training in what it takes to be an effective senior executive. So was lucky about that. Um, but then I, I kind of got interested in executive coaching and business organizational psychology. So decided to go back to school. I was living <clears throat> in Atlanta went back to school at the University of Georgia, commuting over to Athens for four years and finished, finished a PhD. And in that process, learned a lot about the sort of psychological foundations that are so important in coaching. Um, neuropsychology, behavior change, emotional intelligence, all kinds of things. Um, and then got started, uh, gee, about 22 years ago in coaching. And in, the, in that process, went back to the College of Executive Coaching, which is an ICF certified program to get trained. And since then, I've, I've logged, gosh, close to 4,000 plus hours of documented coaching. Anyway, so that was all fine. But what I began to notice over the years as I was doing all that was that people who were coming into coaching were not always particularly well trained. They, in some cases, had partial and in some cases almost no relevant training in business, psychology, and coaching, believe it or not. And I was confused by that. Originally, I thought, gee, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. I, I, I don't understand how there aren't requirements, entry-level requirements for people, because clients spend a hell of a lot of money and put a lot at risk mm -hmm. when they hire an executive coach. So it was confusing. You know, I, I, thought, I thought executive coaching would be like uh, law, medicine, psychology, engineering, and so on. 
you know, real professions with real educational and training requirements. Um, it, I'm, not the, I'm not the smartest guy on the block, but eventually it dawned on me that the industry was so fragmented that it was highly unlikely that the industry would get organized enough to set quality standards for people who wanted to call themselves an executive coach. Mm -hmm. So to get to answer your question, ultimately I was, I arrived at, at the idea that the best thing I could do to help the field and to help the quality standards rise was to write, write this book as a guide for people out there who want to get executive coaching to make sure they get very, very well-trained and highly qualified people to do their coaching. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. That kind of answered the other question I had in my mind was why you felt the need to write a book like this. And you just explained that really well, that the standards simply don't exist. There's no, um, there's no exam that somebody has to pass that then can be shown as a certificate to a prospective client. So, Giving writing a book that helps those potential clients find out what are the most important things to evaluate in, when you're considering hiring a coach. I think that that would be a, another good um, thing to move into right now. Is you mentioned these four different qualifications, and you kind of alluded to them just now, but I'd like you to tell us more about what those are um, and and why they're important for a an executive to consider before making a hiring decision. Sure, sure. Well, you know, Meredith, when I, I do quite a lot of speaking about this and writing and so on and so forth, and you know, when you hold these four things up to people and say, obviously, these, these sort of areas of expertise are important for an executive coach to be effective, Nobody disagrees with that, and I'll get to them in just a second. But I think what happens is when they're faced with a candidate, a prospective coach, who is working hard to market their services, that person naturally is going to accentuate perhaps what they do well or what they're trained in and de-emphasize what they're not trained in, they emphasize the gaps. Nobody can blame them for that. But if the consumer is not recognizing what's happening and is not able to say, well, I'm, I'm glad that you have this qualification, but what about, what about these? They will often go ahead and make a choice, which eventually can turn out badly for them. And I hear stories about that, as I'm sure you do all the time. So the, the four areas, and again, it, this is sort of common sense, but just to walk through them, executive coaches work with executives, business people. Executive coaches, to be effective, need business training. They need to understand what's required to be successful as an executive. They need to understand different functional areas, marketing, strategy, operations. I personally believe that they need not just experience, but very strong education, say from a very strong MBA program. The, the reason for that is they have to be able to jointly problem solve and provide advice and provide perspective with, with an executive. And you can't really do that unless you understand the terrain that that executive is operating in, right? Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 So. Sort of like a non-parent giving advice to a parent. They, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Yes. Yes. Or having someone like me, a very average golfer, trying to give advice to Jordan Spieth or Tiger Woods or, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, second thing is psychology or one of the social sciences, 
one of the other ones, perhaps social work or psychiatry, things like that. Why is that important? Well, in coaching, usually the purpose of coaching is to help the person improve the way they do things, right? Change their behavior, change their awareness, change their perceptions about things, right? Well, psychology is all about behavior change, right? Psychology is all about adult development. It's about neuropsychology. It's about uh, emotional intelligence. There are a whole raft of things that you get trained in that are essential if you want to help the client move from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. right? So, again, you can explain this to people and the, the heads start to nod. And then I'll say something like, well, that, that's interesting. So the coach that you didn't have that good, ex you had a bad experience with, how is that coach trained in psychology? And they'll also say, oh, gosh, I forgot to ask about that, you know. And, you know, $35,000 later, they didn't get what they, what they bargained for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Third thing, coaching, right? Mm -hmm. there, there are, as you know, Meredith, there are tens, if not hundreds of coaching training programs. Right. Just like there are no requirements for someone who wants to call themselves an executive coach. There are no requirements for somebody who wants to open a coach training program. Mm -hmm. So again, coach training programs, let's just say vary enormously in quality. Right. Okay. Um, so, you, you, there are perhaps four or five organizations globally that are pretty solid as, as coaching organizations. One is the International Coach Federation that I happen to be a member of. It provides pretty solid general coach training. And I mentioned earlier that I went to this, uh, this organization called the College of Executive Coaching which is certified, one of the places certified by the ICF, the International Coach Federation. So just, just an important fundamental set of training to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing to mention is sometimes people will, will, in marketing themselves, say, well, don't worry, I'm a, I'm a certified executive coach right? They could be a certified executive coach by dialing an 800 number and spending a hundred bucks and getting a little certificate via email. And I know someone that did something very close to that. <laughs> he went through a very short online training, you know, that then rewarded him with this certificate, but he really had not gotten any of the actual skills that are needed for coaching. So, yeah, I think an important point you're making there with that coaching piece is to find out um, not just what certification they've gotten, what kind of practice they got. Exactly. In that, as a part of that certification, how many people were they required to coach and get feedback about or be supervised with, you know, or conversations uh, what's the word, where they got observed anyway by yeah. someone else yeah. evaluating how effective they were. So there's, you know, for anyone that's not involved in that whole world of coaching, but they're simply seeking someone, they, they don't have the level of sophistication or experience that those of us that know that world have had. And so they just don't know the questions to ask. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I just think your book is so great because you bring out, so, so far you've brought out three, the business side, the psychology side, and the coaching side. So what's the fourth one? Well, and let me just, one other thing about the, about the coaching side, um, Meredith, is the, is the idea that people now, when this book came out seven years ago, um, there was a lot of confusion about 
how to determine the qualifications of somebody. That was one problem. Mm -hmm. Another thing that has happened in the last four or five years is that the number of programs being set up to train someone who says that they are a coach in how to market, how to sell, how to pitch their services, Mm -hmm. that has exploded. Okay. No, there's nothing, I'm a, you know, I'm a former marketing strategy consultant at a big four firm. There's nothing, but marketing's perfectly fine. But if you juxtapose people who don't have complete training with an effort to get better and better and better and better at pitching whatever it is they have, Mm -hmm. what that means for consumers, in my opinion, is that the danger level, the confusion level, the um, buyer beware level is going up, right? Mm-hmm. So, so again, if somebody says they're, they're a certified coach, that's great. Verify what that means. And then also that doesn't, that's not a replacement for being trained in business and psychology because I can tell you since I'm, I'm sort of, highly certified in the ICF world, getting to that point in the ICF world didn't require that I know anything about business or psychology, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And then the, the fourth thing you, you allude to, and this is, you're a very ethical person, I know, Meredith. Basically, coaching is about intangibles. Coaching is about uh, people being vulnerable, asking you for them for for help, un, sort of unearthing what is really difficult for them. Yes, and people people easily can can say the right things, nod their heads, uh, and not really deliver any significant value, right? And unfortunately, the client would never know that until it's too late. So I believe that it's important to operate under a formal ethics code, like one from the International Coach Federation, the American Psychological Association, the American Management Association, that kind of thing. So those are the four things, business psychology or another social science, coaching, and ethics. Ethics. Mm -hmm. So let's think about situations that you've seen, perhaps with a client that ended up hiring you after they had a bad experience. Um, You know, they're looking for results. That's the whole goal of coaching is to help them become more effective in some area that right now is causing a problem for them, right? right? So when you think about these different areas, these four criteria, What are some of the situations, if you could think of one or two examples maybe with clients that you've taken on or maybe even people you've heard about where they had an experience when someone who was lacking one or more of these and what what went wrong? Why didn't they get the results? Well, sure. I, I hear about these situations all the time and sometimes people will seek me out after, unfortunately, they've had a bad experience, uh, sometimes for coaching again, but sometimes just to share, I think because of the book, to share some anecdotes about why the book can be helpful. Mm-hmm. But here's a, here's a typical case. So let's, let's say uh, the executive coach involved in this is a former executive, right? I would say most if you had to pick one population of people that move into coaching most often, it's it's business people, it's executives, which is fine. Mm-hmm. They meet they, that first element. They, they have the business they, experience they, in space. They meet the first element, and of course, they can they can authentically say to the person who is looking at them as a coach that they understand what it's like to be sitting where they're sitting. They get they get what the demands are, and that's fine. So 
you start, let, let's just say you don't think about anything else and you jump into the boat with that business person, that former executive. Uh, what I often hear about is how then when we move past the sort of initial conversations, right, the superficial conversations, mm -hmm. and then we have to get into actually helping people work through the resistance, the natural resistance to changing and improving their behavior, for example. This business person has no idea how to do that or what's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, there's no psychological training to recognize what the challenges are and to help the person navigate through that. I'm guessing they would pretty much just go on how they handled a situation like that when they were an executive, as opposed to having that other framework to draw sure. from. And if they, or, or another typical thing that you hear about is uh, maybe that business person took a one day class on the use of a psychological assessment, right? And so they have their client take the psychological assessment. And to be as tactful about this as possible, they have no significant training in how to actually interpret mm. results. Mm -hmm. right? They can superficially interpret the results. You could get a chimpanzee to superficially you know, interpret the results. But the point is, they either know just enough to give very incorrect and perhaps counterproductive information to the client. Mm -hmm. We hope that doesn't happen. Or they don't know how to give any significant advice to the client based on assessment results. That's another example. Mm -hmm. Sometimes also if you are with a, particularly clients who are under a lot of stress, right? It's not uncommon to see depression or anxiety or a whole host of other psychological challenges in people in significant roles. Mm -hmm. The most normal thing in the world. If you can't recognize what's in front of you and know either how to deal with it directly yourself or how to find other resources, maybe clinical resources to help that person, you're not doing a, you're not doing a good job. So again, it, it's, it's sort of obvious, but, but some, sometimes people will just say, well, that, you know, I went with Jim Smith or Susan Jones because, you know, they were business people, which is perfectly fine if all you want to do is sort of chit chat about business. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you flip, flip the other, flip the other way, and let's just say you have someone who worked for many years as a therapist mm -hmm. and is, first of all, is very interested in helping people, which is an admirable thing, um, tends to understand people very well admirable thing uh, if they if again they they can't put into context what's going on in front of them in terms of the business itself right and the challenges I mentioned that earlier that that knowledge alone of psychology won't won't get them across the finish line okay so yeah. I feel like I'm, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but... No, no, those are two good examples of where, you know, if you think of it as, a, as sort of like a table, if you have two legs or three legs, it is, just isn't going to stand up and be able to support what needs to be done in yeah. order to get the best results. So with that having been considered, what I want to hear about now are some of your own successes and how you've pulled on each of those four elements to deliver really positive results with a specific client. And I'd like you to get specific about, you know, how you use those to identify the problem, 
help them identify what the path or process would be to get to the right. other side where they'd have greater effectiveness. And then what happened when they did make that transition or that transformation that sure. you guided them in? Because that to me is what really great coaching is all about, is helping the person move from that pain point to a, a much better place. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, Meredith. And I, I really first want to say I'm very lucky to work with very talented, very intelligent, uh, you know, very productive people who are already that way mm -hmm. when, I, when I get to them. And I learn as much from them, I'm sure, as they do from me. So it's, uh, you know, there's a lot to be thankful for. Uh, gee, a, a recent example that might be a good illustration, um, a couple of, couple of years ago, I was contacted by uh, someone who is formally trained as a surgeon. Uh, I do quite a lot of work one, in one sector uh, where there's a lot of organizational change right now, uh, healthcare. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I work in, I probably work in 12 different sectors, but healthcare is one of them. Um, and this, this person is is admirable. It has built a department pretty much by himself. Now heads a very large division department of uh, a healthcare institution. Um, classically trained, uh, very bright, very principled, very hardworking, um, actually a very a nice person, really a nice person, a caring person but a high-strung person, and like all of us, he has certain blind spots that he wasn't, let's just say he wasn't seeing in the way he was landing with people mm -hmm. in terms of emotional intelligence. Right. He was very logical. He was very uh, persistent. Uh, he didn't realize, for example, that not everybody around him was as quick and as fast as he was. So he geared the way he communicated to his own IQ, which made all the sense in the world to him. Mm -hmm. And the people around him, in some cases, could keep up with him. In some cases, they couldn't. And the ones that couldn't were too intimidated to say, hey, could you slow down so I can catch up with you? It's a, you know, it's a classic situation. Well, first of all, it took that guy being open to feedback. We did, we, we gathered 360 feedback and so on and so forth. But he, he needed to understand, first of all, that the feedback that was being presented to him was being presented by a psychologist who knew how to interpret it who knew how to read the assessments that we also did for him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he also was facing some real business challenges, management challenges, organizational challenges, right? Reimbursement levels were changing. Uh, certain people were being cooperative. Certain other people weren't. The market was shifting. There were competing health institutions, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the fact, the fact that I am I'm classically trained as an executive and was a strategy consultant and have been, I've been a senior executive, part of the time that we spent together was really in joint problem solving. He wanted a sounding board. Mm -hmm. He wanted to get some advice on how to address a certain situation or maybe retrospectively some feedback on how to how to make sense of something that perhaps had happened in a different way than it, he thought it would happen. Mm -hmm. right. So again, business training was very important. And frankly, I, th I don't think I would have had too much credibility with this guy if I didn't have strong business training. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Um, he, Again, obviously, he, he knew quite a lot about clinical issues, right? 
but but I I was able to clarify for him how uh, coaching is not therapy, and coaching is not mentoring. So I was able to to essentially talk about what it actually realistically was, mm-hmm. and then he, of course, being a physician, he works. Ethics are very important to him. The American Medical Association has a sure. stringent code. Yes. Um, and he, he adheres to it rigorously. He's just a highly principled guy. So I think that was also important. So what, what happened there is he got, because he works hard, uh, he got a lot out of coaching. And I would say he went from being an A-level leader to an A-plus level leader, that much more sophisticated. Mm. And then the, the sort of the nice thing that, that happened as, as a result of that is that I, I've since been uh, fortunate to work with, I think, um, 13 of his colleagues around the system. Mm. Each have that sort of mix of... Um, diligence, hard work, perhaps lacking in, say, emotional intelligence or in some other key areas that are important for them. And many of them are classically clinically trained, but now being thrust into senior leadership roles, Mm. right? Right. And there's, unfortunately, there's not much of a skill transfer between being a spectacular heart surgeon and running a cardiology department. Right. right. No. Yeah. It's like anybody that's a top performer as an individual contributor getting promoted to a supervisory managerial level and going, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's this whole other world I didn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, what, just one other one that I, that's it, it, kind of interesting is, um, uh, and I'm allowed to talk about this, but the CIA has its own internal university, right? It's a gigantic internal educational system. And um, it was, it was an honor as a, as a veteran to be able to get involved in doing some leadership training slash coaching uh, internally for them. Not currently doing that, but did that uh, a few years ago. But the situation there, to your point, Meredith, was if you're an analyst, let's say you're a CIA analyst, mm-hmm. very bright, very hardworking, very analytical, and your job is to know everything about a 100 square mile area of someplace in the world, geographically, economically, socially, culturally, you name it. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're very good at that. And then if you're very, very good at that, you get promoted into being the manager over 15 or 20 analysts. Uh So again, there is, there is no skill transfer between the analyst job and the managing the analyst job. Right. So getting to work with those folks to, to help them transfer to focusing on achieving things through other people, very challenging in some cases. Anyway. Yeah, those are both good examples because I can easily see where all four of those elements would come into play in helping you get the kind of results that will help individuals like that make that transition to more of a a leadership role, especially when they're getting promoted from within and now they're the boss instead of a coworker. And Mm. that's a whole different animal. I'm sure you've seen that that many times. Oh yeah. Across all kinds of industries, but you just gave a couple of really good examples. And to your point and, you know, going back and reinforcing this book and the points you make in it, the results that people can get from working with a coach are going to vary widely if the coach doesn't come with this repertoire of skills and abilities and the four you mentioned um, to help get the best possible results. So I think you've done a real service to people 
who are in the market for a coach. You've given them, I mean, this is a short book, but it's just packed with so many great tips that go deeper into each one of those four elements. And so what I'd like to do is just ask you to tell people where can they get a copy of the book and also get in touch with you if they'd like to know more about you and your services. Oh, well, th thank you, uh, Meredith. Well, the, the book is available on you know, various sites. Amazon is where I think most people get it. And uh, now I'd say almost everybody gets it in sort of a digital kin Kindle, Kindle. Mm -hmm. sort, sort of uh, format. Um, and uh, I, th there's a website that we have called QuinnReadAssociates.com, just the name of it, Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N-R-E-E-D, Associates.com. Okay. Great. Uh, there is a website for the book itself called Pinpointing Excellence, all one word, dot okay. com. Pinpointing uh, Excellence, dot com. Uh, um, there's a LinkedIn group. If, if uh, this interests you, we'd love to have you, you join. Uh, there's a LinkedIn group where this kind of information gets posted. Uh, oh, great. And it's called Pinpointing Excellence in Executive Coaching. Um, and, and then if my email is just john at quinreadassociates.com. And I, if there's anything I can ever do uh, to help people get better at applying these criteria so that they get higher returns and better results from their coaching investments, my, my hope is really just to, I'd like to see executive coaching, Meredith, become a real profession with real requirements. And there are a lot of other coaches like me who are who are interested in elevating raising, the whole game, raising the bar. Yes. Uh, but we've we've just learned that the waiting for the coaching field to to regulate itself is you Oops. know. Is like uh, you know the, the the famous play waiting for Godot, you know that's that's basically what we're talking about. It it will never happen. So, so thank you so much, John, for um, spending time with me today and helping us understand what's really involved in this whole coaching profession and what's really needed. And, and on that note, I would recommend any executive coach or an aspiring executive coach get your book and read it too, not just the people who are looking to hire an executive coach, because I think you map out so clearly what those uh, requirements really are. Thank you so much, Meredith, and thank you for, for having me today. I oh, thanks so much for being with me, John. Okay, take care. You too.